we go. Um, we, uh, we obviously are, are past Christmas, but how many of you know that the 12 days of Christmas aren't quite over yet? Amen? That the 12 days of Christmas, did you know that that actually starts on Christmas Day? We get so excited and so thrilled about Christmas coming that we celebrate all before Christmas. And you know people who actually take their tree down on Christmas Day. It's like, man, it's over. We're done. But traditionally, Christmas started on Christmas Eve, the day, and then we went 12 days after that. And we're still in that. That's still Wednesday. Celebrating Christmas. And so um, the manger is still visible. And I want to talk this morning about something that that really kind of grabbed me um, this Christmas season. As I was reading through the Christmas story, as I was reading through the Gospels, what I realized was that it was a very different perspective of Christmas from the various Gospels. In fact, that when you looked at Luke's Gospel, you found a whole lot more included in in Luke's story. And and that Luke seemed to be going like, you know, blow by blow, you know, story by story, every piece being included. And and it makes a lot of sense. What Luke says in in verse 1. Now, Luke is is not one of the disciples, but look what it says. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those whom from the beginning were eyewitnesses to the servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully, from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order. Most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that you have been taught. And so when we look at Luke's gospel, man, man, he's got all kinds of stuff in there about the Christmas story. You know, he's got the the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. He's got the angel coming to Mary. He's got Mary's visit to Elizabeth. He's got Mary's song. He's got the birth of John the Baptist. He's got Zechariah's prophecy after John's born. He, you know, he has Joseph and Mary coming to Bethlehem. He's got the birth of Jesus. He's got the angels and the shepherds. He's got, you know, Jesus being dedicated on the eighth day. He's got the stories of Simeon and Anna in the temple prophesying and declaring who Jesus is. Man, he gives you a blow by blow. But then you turn to the Gospel of Matthew, and it's totally different. Because you see, Matthew wrote from a Jewish perspective. See, when Matthew told the Christmas story, he was telling the story about the pieces that would be critical in understanding the Messiah's coming from a Jewish perspective. How Jesus' coming fit into prophecy. How it fit into the pieces of the Scriptures and the story of the Old Testament of how it would be foretold. And so when you look at Matthew's Gospel, we find stuff like the genealogy of Jesus. How many of you went to a Christmas play and they played out the genealogy? None of us. We just kind of like blow over that. Why? Because it doesn't doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. But to the Jews, it was critical. Because it was a prophetic declaration of who Jesus was and the line that he was coming from. You know, we find the conception and the birth of Jesus as a virgin critical to the prophetic fulfillment. You know, we find, you know, Holy Spirit coming upon Mary. We find Joseph being obedient to the law, saying he was going to put Mary away quietly. That was obedience to the law that he was following. And then the angel comes and says, the Lord says, here's what you need to do. And Joseph being obedient to the Lord. And then, do you know, we find six verses where they come, basically where they get pre- Mary gets pregnant, Holy Spirit comes on here, they get married, they come to Bethlehem, they have the baby. Six verses. The entire Christmas story, six verses. Why? Because that wasn't as important as the fulfillment of prophecy. And then Matthew does something interesting. He jumps to the wise men. As you look at Matthew chapter 2, suddenly he jumps to this story about kings. And in the next 12 verses in Matthew 12, in those first 12 verses, Matthew introduces us to three sets of kings. He introduces us to the Magi, the kings from the east. He introduces us to King Herod. And he introduces us to the true king, Jesus. Twelve verses talking about kings. Six verses talking about the birth. There's got to be something about that. 
Very diverse kings. See, the first set of kings, the, the wise men, they came to worship the new king. King Herod had no desire to worship the new king. And, and then we have Jesus, the true king, the king of the Jews. Very diverse, very different kings. So the question really is, why? Why was it so important for Matthew to spend so much time talking about kings? Because Israel was looking for the king. Israel, under oppression of the Roman Empire, was believing the prophecies that declared that there was a Messiah coming. And when he came, he would sit on the throne of David. And their belief is he would restore. They were very interested in the fact that there was kings. And Matthew contrasts these three kings to point, that, to point to the fact that Jesus was the true king. But this morning, I, I want to look at the wise men, that first set of kings, because I believe there's some things in there that will truly help us as we think about heading into this new year, into 2021 and what God has planned for us. I think there's some key lessons there. And so let's, let's watch for a second. Are they here? As your advisor, I feel compelled to communicate my hesitation about this meeting. Do you even know these men? We do not. So why even take a meeting with them? They are stargazers. They are Gentiles. These men have valuable information. We play our cards right. They will help us infinitely more than we can help ourselves. Now send them in. Gentlemen, greetings. Welcome. Welcome. My staff tells me you've come a long way. This is true. We've come from the East. Is that right? And I trust your journeys have not been too difficult. They're like most journeys. Some good, some bad, but mostly long. <laughs> so tell me, as a man who doesn't do much journeying myself anymore, what is it that would inspire men such as yourself to undertake such a long trip. Well, as I'm sure you know, word has been spreading about the birth of a Messiah. We witnessed his star, and so we have come to worship him. Is that right? A new Messiah. I must admit, I feel a little silly this is the first I'm hearing of this. It's said to be in a place called Bethlehem. Do you know where we could find this place? Lucky for you, Bethlehem is only about 10 miles away. 10 miles? Ah, that's such a relief. After so many miles, ten seems just around the corner. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> I know you're eager to resume your journey and witness this new Messiah firsthand, but please, before you go, allow me to be a good host and offer you a drink. To the Messiah. To the new king. Would you do me a favor? Of course. Once you have found this new king, would you come back and tell me exactly where he is so that I might have the opportunity to go and worship him myself? Consider it done, King Herod. Safe travels.
King Herod seems like a really great guy, huh? But what we find the story of these kings in Matthew 2, and I just want to read a little bit here. Matthew 2, verse 1 says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, magi from the east, kings from the east, arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born the king of Jews? For we have saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Verse 9 says, And after hearing the king, they went on their way, and the star which had been seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the palace where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. And then offering their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Now, all of us, when we see the Christmas play, when we do put out our nativity sets, when we put all that out, those out, whenever we see you know, the, the birth of Jesus portrayed, who's there? The wise men. The wise men are all there, and I hate to burst your bubble, but the reality is they weren't there. They weren't there on the night that Jesus was born. They didn't show up with gifts while they were still in the manger and still in the stable or wherever they were. They didn't come then. You know, it's, it's just like we talked about the innkeeper last week. We have filled in the pieces to consolidate the story to, ma- to make it fit well within our 20-minute window. And yet, Scripture says something a little different about the kings. In fact, it says that the kings themselves had traveled a long way. The wise men were actually from Persia. And if you look, that's modern-day Iraq. That's a thousand miles from Jerusalem. And so here were these kings, and they had made a, 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 a thousand-mile journey, six, nine, maybe even twelve months They had been on the road, traveling, coming. And when they get to Bethlehem, they enter into the house where they were staying, and they saw the child with Mary. And the Greek word there says that for child means young child. That Jesus was no longer a baby. They were no longer in the stable. They were now living in a house. And that Jesus was a young child. In fact, Matthew uses young child nine times in seven verses. That he was a toddler. That Jesus was probably between a year and two years old, based on what we know from Herod and how his response was, what he learned from the Magi. And so here is this picture of men who have traveled a long, long way. Now, the wise man came to find this new Messiah. Think about that. They made a thousand mile journey to a place they'd never been searching for a king they didn't know about, what was it that caused them to do that? What, what was the big deal? How did they know that, about the king and that they were to follow a star? Well, a lot of, for a long time, people have said, well, you know, well, they were astrologers. They watched the stars, and so they saw this star in the sky, and when they saw this star, it was so magnificent that they decided that something incredible must have happened, and so they followed it for all this way, all the way to Judea. It's not what the text says. The text says they saw the star and they knew and they went. You say, well, Brian, how, how did they know? How would they know? Th- these guys weren't believers. These weren't Jews. They were magicians. They were sorcerers. They were, you know, those folks we find in Daniel working for King Nebuchadnezzar. That's who we're talking about here. We're talking about those who watch the stars. You say, well, how did they know? They didn't have the scriptures. But what they did have was the prophecies of Balaam. You say, Balaam? Balaam? Who, what, what's that got to do with that? And so I got a question for you. Who, who, has any, who can tell me anything about Balaam? Come on, I got the candy. Anybody know anything about Balaam? Come on, Earl, tell me one thing about Balaam. The donkey talked to him. Amen. That's, what, that's a, the thing we remember because you know why? That's what we, that was our favorite, one of our favorite stories in Sunday school. Man, a talking donkey. As boys, man, we're like, yeah! Man, I used to get a donkey to talk to him. Man. Wouldn't that be great? But, but let me tell you the whole story about Balaam real quick. See, 
When the Israelites came out of, Is- or came out of Egypt, you know, they came out in the wilderness and they defeated the Amalekites, but the Amalekites, the Moabites were there also, and, and Balak was the king of Moab, and he was afraid. He was afraid the Israelites were going to overtake him, and so, you know, he comes, hatches a plan. He decides he's going to go find this guy named Balaam. Now, Balaam was a prophet of the Lord who had the reputation of when he blessed someone, they were blessed. When he cursed someone, they were cursed. And so Balak says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send a delegation to go find Balaam, and I'm going to send cash and prizes, and I want him to come and curse Israel. And so the delegation comes, and they come to see Balaam, and Balaam says, all right, got to check with the Lord. And he goes and checks with the Lord, and the Lord says no. And so he tells the delegation, they go back, Balak's not happy. So what's he do? He sends another delegation with bigger prizes and cash. And Balaam's like, well, i got to check with the Lord. And the Lord says, it's okay, you can go with them as long as you say what I tell you to say. But here's the problem. Balaam, in his heart decided he was going to curse Israel because he wanted cash and prizes. And so he gets on a donkey and he goes to meet up with Balak in order to to perform this thing. And as they're traveling along, Scripture says that an angel of the Lord came and stood in the path with a mighty sword. And the donkey saw the angel, but Balaam couldn't. And the donkey stopped and Balaam starts beating the donkey. The angel moves on down the road and the donkey continues on and stops again when it sees the angel. And Balaam, he's beating beating the donkey happens a third time, only this time when he starts beating the donkey, suddenly Balaam can see the angel. And the angel says to Balaam, if you're donkey, why are you beating that donkey? If you had, he had not stopped, I would have killed you. And then the donkey starts talking to Balaam, and Balaam has a change of heart. Amen? I tell you, your donkey starts talking to you? Your dog, your cat starts talking to you? You might, you might repent and, and change your mind about some stuff. Amen? Some stuff might start happening. And so, we'll make a long story short, Balaam, he goes on, he travels to Balak, and they go up on a mountain overlooking Israel, and Balaam says, I want you to make seven altars with seven sacrifices. And the first time they go up there, Balaam goes to speak, and he speaks a blessing over Israel. Balak's got his tunic tightening up now. He said, what are you doing? You can't do that. He said, let's go again. So they went a second time, blessed him again, and a third time, and blessed him again. The fourth time they go up on the mountain... Balaam prophesied that there the Messiah would come through, he would be born in Judea and his birth would be marked by the star. You say, well, what's that got to do with the wise men? See, the piece that we most don't understand is that Balaam was the father of the founder of the Magi. See, they knew the prophecies of Balaam. They knew what Balaam had told them centuries earlier. And when the star appeared, instantly they knew it was a sign. It was a sign that the Messiah had been born in Judea. Now you say, well, didn't they chase the star? I don't, I don't believe so. I mean, you remember two weeks ago on, on, the, on Monday the 21st, there was Saturn and Jupiter came together. We couldn't see it here. But you saw pictures on Tuesday. It was still pretty cool on Tuesday. And, and the reality is that we don't know for sure how God put a star in the sky. But, but many have come to believe it was probably you know, something in the heavens, something about the planets coming together. In fact, scientists have backtracked. You, know, you can track stars. You know how, how they move. That in April of 6 BC, that there was Saturn and Jupiter came together along with the sun and the moon, and what would have been in the sky would have been unbelievably bright. Incredible. You say, well, that's April. Well, I hate to burst your bubble. Jesus wasn't born in December. We, they believe he was born in April. We just put Christmas in December for other reasons. But the reality is that the star happened, and when they saw the star, they took off. They knew where they were going. They were going to Judah. And so I want you to think about that. So here they come. They've been traveling for a thousand miles. All they know is he's going to be born in Judah. And so what do they do? They come to Judah. They, you come into a country. You know, Pat, if you're looking for a king, where are you going? Probably the palace. And so they go to Jerusalem. They go to the palace. They go to Herod. Why? Because they don't know where they're going. 
Come on, they're, here are the wise men. They're kind of lost. They don't have any directions on where they're next going. You know, some, some people say there must have been a couple of women with them because otherwise they'd never stop and ask. <laughs> Come on. But the reality is they have to stop and ask for directions. And so they come to Herod, and they're like, hey, we've come to meet the king of the Jews, the new Messiah. Where, where is he? And Scripture says that they get out Micah 5, and they say he's to be born in Bethlehem. Six, seven miles, ten miles, depends on how you go, from the palace in Jerusalem. What an incredible picture. What an incredible pi- place. And so it says that they came out. You say, well, didn't they follow the star? Well, look what it says, verse 9. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went before them. And it came and stood over the place where the child was. They come out of the palace, and suddenly there's that star. Six or seven miles, Gaston from here. Hey, come on. That's what we're talking about, right? Far side of Gaston. Star up in the sky marking the spot where we're going to go. No, it says no, that, that it led them and stood over the house where Jesus was. Maybe that was a star. Maybe that was something. Maybe it was an angel. We don't know. But all we know is that God directed them from the palace to the place where Jesus was. Amen? Showed them where it was. And when they get there, Three things happen that I think are going to be important for us as Prairie Grove, for us individually, but us as Prairie Grove in this, in this next year. And I want to start with this one. Number one, that the wise men rejoiced with an exceedingly great joy. Verse 10, and when they saw the star, when they saw that the star had reappeared, when they saw it moving, when it saw them land on, set on top of the house, it, that they rejoiced with a joy, with a joy that was exceedingly great. Can you imagine that? Exceedingly great joy. That meant they got happy, right? They got happy. They were like, hey, that's super. That's awesome and that's wonderful. Is that rejoicing with an exceedingly great joy? What's it look like to rejoice with an exceedingly great joy what's that look like oh that was nice is that oh that was special brenda did you see that that was awesome wasn't it is that exceedingly great joy no i i got a question aaron when when Everett is playing basketball and we're coming down to the end of the half, and he comes down, and they pass the ball to him, and he pulls up and busts a three-pointer at the buzzer, you're like, good job, son. (laughs) Is that how you rejoice? No. Would you like to show us how you rejoice? It's like, woo, come on, come on, woo, man, that's my son, way to bug, woo, yeah, woo. Isn't it? Exceedingly great joy. Sarah, when one of the boys drives one down the left field line in the last inning and two runs score and they win the game, you're like, oh, good job, boys. I can imagine Sarah is like, yeah, she's jumping around, probably dancing in the, in the, in the stands a little bit. That's my boy. Did you see what he did? That's my boy. Exceedingly great joy, amen? Amen. See, there's something about exceedingly great joy that can't stay in here. Amen? Exceedingly great joy. You know, see, some people say, well, I, I, I'm joyful. And our response is, well, somebody should tell your face. <laughs> Come on, I got joy. Well, you couldn't tell it by looking at you. Come on, exceedingly great joy. Come on. Y'all know how to have exceedingly great joy. Now, I'm not here to tell you what it has to look like, but you know what it looks like. And you know what that stirs in you. But here's the question I have for you. When do we rejoice with an exceedingly great joy over Jesus? 
Come on now, we can rejoice at ball games and rejoice at, at this and bonuses and, you know, Corey and I are going to the Super Bowl. Free tickets, free trip, right, Corey? Yeah, he's rejoicing back there. <laughs> he's woohooing. We can rejoice over those things, but when and where is it that we rejoice with an exceedingly great joy over Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Messiah, the one who holds the universe in his hands, the one who can do all things? You say, well, Brian, I, I, we can't get, we, we need to control ourselves. We, we need to make sure that we hold some of that in because if we got too excited, people might look at us a little funny. And I'm not talking about the ball game, I'm talking about at church. Come on now. Earl start, gets up and starts dancing right here in the aisle. You're going to think, well, what's Earl smoking? Come on. We know Earl wouldn't, but you're like, well, what's wrong with Earl? Right? Why? Because we're supposed to be a little, we're supposed to be reserved. I, I, I don't know. It says that these wise men, listen, these guys weren't, 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 weren't boobs. These guys weren't, you know, just some yokels off the street. These were wealthy kings who represent highly educated men who are on their way and come to the house and see the star and start hooping and hollering, start dancing or high-fiving one another or chest-bumping one another. They're filled with all this joy, exceedingly great joy. Why? Because they've encountered Jesus. They found Jesus. Come on. I'm not saying it has to happen all the time, but there ought to be some times when we get excited. Amen? Come on, Barb, you got some, exci- you got some, you got some excitement in you? Sometimes. Well, let, let's think about when that might be. I don't know, somebody gets saved. Come on, man, what should be our response when someone gets saved? Come on, we all, woo, come on, we can't contain ourselves. We gotta get up, we gotta shout, we gotta dance around a little bit. That's what the angels are doing. That's what the word says. When, when someone gets saved, the angels are, are throwing a throwdown party in heaven over them. How should we be any less who are greater, have greater access to God than they do? Amen? Come on, last Sunday, Anna, Anna walked away from the gates of hell into the promises of Jesus. Amen? Come on! Woo! That's a reason to get excited. But listen, sometimes we think, you know, we just need to hold that in. I'll tell you what, I was at a church once, and we had an altar call, and three people came to the altar that day. And they were here, and I was ministering, Brenda was helping me minister, and a couple others. And I don't know, it took five, ten minutes, maybe a little longer. I stood up from kneeling with people at the altar, turned around, and there wasn't one person left in the room. They all went home. I asked, uh, what was that all about? Where did you guys all go? They said, well, that really didn't involve us. Come on now. That's not the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? Come on. Somebody gets saved, there ought to be a party. Somebody gets baptized, there ought to be a party. Somebody gets healed, come on, we ought to be jumping around. Amen? Amen? Come on, because we have witnessed God, Jesus Christ, in the power as King of Kings, doing something incredible and miraculous, and we ought to get excited about it. See, the world looks at the church and says, you guys all get more excited about football than you do about Jesus. Why should I come? Come on, I'm just talking truth now. You're more excited about other things than you are about Jesus. You're more joyful about other things than Jesus. The wise men rejoiced with an exceedingly great joy. But watch what it says secondly here. It says that they worshipped exuberantly. Watch what it says. After coming into the house, they saw the child, the young child, with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Now, I want you to think about this. They come to the house, and here's Mary and the baby. Where's Joseph? (laughs) My man's got a job. J-O-B, baby. He's got to put some food on the table, right? They came in the middle of the day. And here is Mary and Jesus in the house. He's between one and two years old, probably walking a little bit, toddling around in the house, can barely speak. And I want you to notice what it says. They walk into the house and they fell to the ground. Now that phrase in the Greek means this. It means to throw down violently. It means to shatter, to be broken into pieces. Not just, hey, I tripped and I fell. No, 
they threw themselves down completely broken before Jesus. Not the king of kings, the toddler. They threw themselves down and they worshipped him. Everything they had poured out in worshiping and praising and honoring and giving him adoration. Why? Not because of what he had done for them, but because of who he was. Come on now, our worship ought to be based in who he is, not what we got. Come on now. They worshipped him exceedingly. Why? Because he was the Messiah. Which begs the question... When do we worship Jesus exuberantly? I don't know. The Word says He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And if He was worthy of exuberant worship at one year old, He's still worthy. Amen? If He was worthy before He came, He's worthy now. Amen? Amen? What's it look like for us to exuberantly worship the Lord? Now, I'm not telling you what that has to look like. But here's the deal. That has to be something in you that says, how am I... And I'm not just talking about here on Sunday morning. I'm talking about your worship in the car. I'm talking about your worship at home. I'm talking about worship in your bedroom. I'm talking about worship with your spouse. I'm talking about worship wherever it is that you're worshiping and praising and honoring God. What's it look like to do that? Exuberantly. I'm just worshiping God. Great. But listen, there are some things that happen to our bodies, to our voices, to our eyes when we begin to truly release the worship and the praise that He's worthy of. Say, well, Brian, you're talking about getting up and running around. No, I'm not. Maybe. That's you. But maybe that's not Earl. But listen, we have to be willing to allow the worship and the praise that Holy Spirit wells up in us flow out of us. And listen, sometimes that's quiet, and we're going to talk about that in the coming weeks some. But listen, sometimes that's got a little step in it. Amen? So, sometimes that, that's got a clap. Sometimes I, I can't just help myself. I've got to get my hand up. Come on. Come on. I've seen Earl. Every once in a while, man, it's just like, whoa, man, I've got to get my hand up. Amen? Because he's that good. He's that worthy. Amen? They worshipped him exuberantly. So when and where do we do that? It's just a question that I believe that we have to begin to answer in our own hearts. And even as a church, how, how do we worship him and enable people to worship him exuberantly? Amen. In their way. We all, we're all a little different, amen? God created us all a little different, but listen, the exuberance may look a little different, but it's still exuberance. Amen? Amen? And then here's the third part. You ready? They gave extravagantly. They gave extravagantly. Verse 11 says, Then they opened their treasuries, and they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. See, we love to talk about the gifts. In the play, we all got the box and the gifts, amen? We, we see the gifts. Did you know that it never says there's three wise men, there's just three gifts? It's easier to just have three men and three gifts. They came, uh, before they ever left, they had gifts ready to give, amen? All right? But I think that's just a word for us anyway. What are we bringing to give to the Jesus? But look, notice that they gave extravagantly. It says they opened their treasure or their treasury. Now, in that day when you traveled, you had to have a treasury. You had to have a strong box, if you will. And in that box was all the resources that you would need for the trip. No credit cards, no ATM, no traveler's checks for us older folk. You know, no Western Union. You remember, I'm a traveler's checks, come on now. We, I used to have, tra I can remember the first time I went somewhere, my mom gave me traveler's checks. I'm like, I'm only going like two, you know, 50 miles when you need traveler's checks. But the reality is, you had to have the money with you. And you had to, out of that treasury, someone was responsible for it. You know, in fact, Judas, remember Judas? 
of the disciples, he was in charge of the money bag, the treasury. Come on, when they traveled, he was the one keeping track. And, and out of that, you had to pay your, your traveling expenses, you had to pay for your, your room and board, or, or whatever it is that you needed along the way. You know, if a camel blows a tire, man, you better have something to take care of that. Come on, what are you going to do if you need a new camel and you ain't got nothing to pay for it with? Man, you had to make sure you had plenty. And so they get there, and, and, and they go in, and they see, and they get in the presence of Jesus, and all of a sudden, one of the wise men says, open the treasury. And the guy over the treasury is like, well, yeah, here's the gifts. He's like, no, no, no. Get out the rest of it. We're giving more than we planned. We're coming to give extravagantly. This is the Messiah. This is the King of the world. The King of the universe. But, but, but we got to have that to get back. And I don't know what they gave, but they gave far more than they intended to. They gave extravagantly to Jesus. As soon as you hear the word give, someone says, well, you're talking about your money, Pastor. No, I'm not talking about just your money. I'm talking about your gifts and your talents and your time and your abilities, your presence. To give extravagantly. To give beyond. See, extravagant giving means what? I give more than I intended. I give more than made sense. I gave more than what seems reasonable. And the question becomes, how are we giving extravagantly to Jesus? Giving extravagantly of our time of our talent, of our, our, our abilities, of our, of our lives, of our hearts, of our, everything that we are. How are we giving? And I'm not talking just in church, I'm talking in life. How am I giving extravagantly in the name of Jesus? And that includes my money too. Some of you are giving extravagantly to your kids right now because you're raising up kids. And time's limited, amen? But you give extravagantly. There's some in the church who... You know what I watch? You're giving exagger. You know, you're you're giving far beyond what seems reasonable, extravagantly, of that which God has given you. But the question for all of us is how am I giving to God extravagantly? Giving to Jesus extravagantly. So why well, can't do that all the time? I didn't say all the time. I said when when he opens the door, goes back to the whole series on invitation. As he invites us in, what am I willing, how extravagant am I willing to give in response to what he's asked? Because of who he is, not because of what he's done. Well, God's been so good to me, I'm going to give. How about, God's kept me alive, I'm going to give. Come on. Because of who he is. You say, well, Brian, what's, what's the big deal of that? Why do you make such a big deal about these three things? Well, I want you to know something interesting. Before these three wise men, before these kings, rejoiced with an exceedingly great joy, before they worshipped exuberantly, before they gave <coughs> extravagantly, they had to go to someone else to find out what the Bible said. They had to go somewhere else to find out what God wanted. Amen? They got to Judah. They had no idea where to go. We don't know what to do, so we're going to go to the, to the palace. We're going to see the king, uh, you know, see Herod, and see if he can't give us some direction. And what they do, they got out Micah 5. They said, he's to be born in Bethlehem. The scribes interpreted the word for them and told them what the Lord was saying and had said, so they knew what to do. Hey, I want you to understand, nothing wrong with that. Not, absolutely nothing wrong with that. And so what they do, they went. And they followed the star, and they found Jesus. But I want you to notice something interesting. After they rejoiced with an exceedingly great joy, after they worshiped exuberantly, after they gave extravagantly, they didn't have to go to somebody else to hear from the Lord. They heard from the Lord directly. Verse 12 says that in a dream, the Lord said to them directly, here's what I want you to do. Come on now, maybe, just maybe, if we need to hear from the Lord, maybe a part of that begins with us re beginning to rejoice with an exceedingly great joy. If we need direction from the Lord, maybe we need to begin to worship exuberantly. Maybe if we need 
God's direction, we need to begin to give extravagantly to Him. Because what happens when I do those three things? I encounter Him. I grow in intimacy of Him. I draw closer to Him. See, it's not about us. It's all about Him. Amen? Amen. Those three things are all about Him and has nothing to do with us. And when we do those things, we draw closer, we grow in intimacy, we grow in relationship, and God says, now let me talk to you straight. Straight face to face. Well, I don't think the Lord speaks to people today. Well, I believed that for a long time. And I was wrong. I was wrong. Because this book is filled with the promise that He wants to speak to you and to speak to me. Through His Spirit. But a lot of times it's like, Lord, I need you to talk to me. Lord, would you just, I need to hear from you. I need you to direct me. And maybe you're just sit, instead of sitting around, one of my favorite taglines is, instead of sitting on the couch eating Doritos, watching TV, waiting for God to say something, maybe we ought to start to rejoice in all that he's given us, in all who he is, with an exceedingly great joy. Maybe we ought to start worshiping him exuberantly. Maybe we ought to start giving extravagantly while we're waiting, while we're listening, while we're saying, Lord, we want to hear from you. Listen, Prairie Grove Christian Church, we need to hear from the Lord. Does anybody here not agree with that statement? Come on, do you believe that? That for the coming year and the direction he wants us to go, the things he wants to do, the things he wants us to be about, there's a billion things we could do. We only want to do what he wants to do. And if we do that, we've got to hear from him, right? He's got to lead us and direct us. And so I just want to challenge us as we begin this year, and we're going to talk about it over the next few weeks, of what it might look like, what the Word has to say about rejoicing, about joy. Rejoicing with an exceedingly great joy, of worshiping exuberantly, the giving extravagantly, what, what those things look like from the, from the text. That as we begin those things, I believe God's going to begin to speak and begin to share and begin to proclaim things over this congregation and say, here's where I have, this is where I want to lead you. This is where I want you to go. This is what I'm calling you to. This is the direction. Amen? See, God wants to do that. And so I just want to invite you this morning to say, Lord, Lord, I'm in. In, this, in 2021, Lord, you can mold and shape me. Lord, you can, you can make me whatever you desire to make me. Lord, we want to hear from you. Lord, we want to begin to grow in you and your intimacy. And Lord, we want to begin to be like those wise men who pour out, who pour out themselves to you. Because when we pour ourselves out, Lord, you're the one who's faithful to fill us up. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. And Lord, just now I... I invite all of us, Lord, Lord, would you just speak to each of us individually and as families as, as, a, as a body of Christ? Lord, stir our hearts, Holy Spirit. Lord, just take what you've shared today, Lord, and just speak into us. Lead us, stir us, Lord. Work in us in a mighty, mighty way. God, we want to be all that you've created us to be, all that you're calling us to be, all that you want we want to see happen what you want to see happen in this year, in the years and the beyond here. And so, Lord, we just offer ourselves. Lord, even this morning we fall broken before you, Jesus. And say, Lord, have your way. We thank you for that, Father. And all God's people said.